Hello, this is Chris Safarova, CEO of FermsConsulting.com and StrategyTraining.com. Welcome to another great session. We are here with Julia Borstin, a CNBC's senior media and tech correspondent. She covers media with a special focus on the intersection of media and technology. A graduate of Princeton University, she has been a reporter for Fortune magazine as well as a contributor to CNN. Welcome, Julia. It's great to have you with us today. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Julia, to begin with, could you take us back and share with us your backstory? Well, I have a very simple uh, career trajectory. I've only had two jobs. Um, I've been at CNBC for the past 16 years, and I was at Fortune Magazine for six years before that. So my whole professional life has been business journalism. Um, I, you know, worked on the newspaper as a kid in high school, and I worked on the newspaper at Princeton. I was at the Daily Princetonian. But actually, when I was in college, I thought I was going to go into international relations. I was an intern at the White House. Um, during the Clinton administration, and then I was a State Department intern. I actually worked for the um, the, the State Department's delegation to the U.S. Um, the U.S. Uh, delegation to the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. So, had a lot of experience in sort of international relations. But ultimately, what I found was that journalism is just such a powerful way to reach so many people and to learn so many things. And ultimately. I think my superpower is that I love to ask questions. And I think my love of asking questions makes me good at asking questions and learning different things. So after a, a lot of experience in that sort of political and international realm, I landed at, um, at Fortune Magazine straight out of Princeton and have just been in love with business news ever since. Julia, and of course, it's not easy to get to a level of CNBC's senior media and tech correspondent. Can you tell us a little bit of what was that journey like? Yes. So um, when I graduated from Princeton, I I wanted to get, you know, to I actually thought I was going to go to grad school, but I wanted to defer for a year and have the experience of working at a magazine in New York. At the time, it was 2000, and there was so much energy and excitement in the news industry. Since then, of course, the news business has really struggled with advertising declines and all of that. But I just wanted to see what it was like to be in that nexus of energy and, and power in Manhattan. So I applied to a bunch of jobs and magazines and the best job I got at the time, and this was 2000, was at Fortune Magazine. I was actually the last person Fortune hired before the dot-com bubble burst. So I got my job, the dot-com bubble burst, and then I started my job about two, year, two months later um, in June July 2000, right after the dot-com bubble burst. And it was a crazy time to be at the magazine that was covering business. And, you know, Fortune, such a leader in business news. And to watch the evolution of the, of the internet economy before our eyes, the transformation of how so many people interacted with the stock market and to really be in that seat instead of going to grad school a year later, because I deferred grad school for a year, I thought this is so exciting. And business news is such an amazing opportunity, not just to cover businesses, but to cover big personalities and to really learn about how the world works. So I was really struck in my early years at Fortune Magazine about just how much you can do through the lens of business news. And at a time when so much of the news cycle is about celebrities and about um, memes and stories that come and go, business news really allows you to get the, to the meat and the heart of so many it, it, very important topics. Julia, and of course, there's a lot of competition in your space. What do you think were some key reasons why you were able to succeed and, and get to all those amazing roles? Well, so I feel like my, my job has evolved from the business reporter role at Fortune Magazine, which is about writing articles, to the TV reporter role, which is also about presenting my stories. I write my scripts, but instead of having them be printed, I'm presenting them on live television. So I think there are various skill sets I draw upon and various skill sets that I've had to learn and improve upon. And I think at the core of what a journalist does and is, it's about asking questions, but also really listening in a different way. And um, I love to ask questions. My whole life, I've been that annoying kid who asks too many questions. My girlfriends would always say to me, oh, you're asking so many questions. We want to hear what's going on with you. This is, it is something that's very much core to who I am to just ask a million questions. 
But I think as a journalist, it's great that I had that instinct, but I also had to figure out how to evolve that skill set of question asking. Obviously, question asking can be incredibly valuable no matter what industry you're in. You always need to get information. But I think that the, the key I learned in asking questions, which is really core to my everyday, is preparing a list of questions that I was going to want to ask someone. Even if I didn't know if I was going to definitely have the opportunity to talk to them, just get those questions down. And I, my secret is I like to write down a list of questions really early. If I know I'm going to have a big CEO interview in two days, I will write down my questions on Monday because it gives me more time to go over them in my head and think about how I could change them or adapt them. So I think there's something about that process of just getting that draft done of the questions and then having more time to reflect. My other, um, my other uh, approach to things is I just over-prepare. In a live interview, especially on television, you never know what someone is going to say and you need to be prepared to react and you need to have the data and understanding to know what you should push them on. So I always totally over-prepare. Um, I have these giant Google Docs full of, of background info. I read analyst reports. So it always depends what the subject is. But I think the more I'm over-prepared, the more, A, I'm not going to be nervous, no matter how high stakes this uh, interview is, whether it's in front of hundreds of people on stage or whether it's on TV. But I know that if someone says something, I can push them on it. So um, if someone makes some claim about their business, I could say, well, here's what the data shows. Are you, you do you really want to make that assertion? And that kind of homework and data um, enabled me, especially when I was 22 years old at Fortune Magazine, interviewing people who were twice or three times my age enabled me to be able to stand up to them and really push to get um, to get real answers. Julie, and in that transition from writing to being on TV and communicating orally, this is a huge transition, very different skill set, although there are some similarities, of course. What surprised you? What you did not expect? It's so hard. It's so different. You know, writing, you have all the time in the world to, to think about things. You could spend hours agonizing over a paragraph and television, it's all about instant communication. I think the same is true if you go into a meeting and have to give a presentation. And that same, I would say there are two parts of my job as a TV reporter. One, the, they're the um, scripts that I write to deliver on live TV. And I would say those are probably akin to giving a presentation. And then there's the live conversations that I have on TV. And those are what we call on TV, you call them crosstalks. So for instance, I might go on and do a crosstalk about the latest on Meta or the latest with Twitter and Elon Musk. And I know the topic, but I'm not sure exactly what questions are going to be asked or what direction it's gonna go into, or what someone I'm being interviewed with at the same time might ask. That to me, you know, whereas the scripts are like the presentations in a meeting, the crosstalks are like the way you might get interviewed if you're applying for a job, or the way you might have to defend a project you're doing um, for your boss. So all of these things that I'm doing, I know they're very, very good analogies for any other um, workplace. In terms of the scripts, it's really hard to keep things short. It's really hard to be concise. I think it was um, Mark Twain who said, I would have written you um, a short letter, but it was easier to write a long one or something to that effect. Yes. And to go from writing 2,000, 3,000 word articles to writing a 90 second script really was a, was a hard transition. But ultimately I learned that you just sort of have to write conversationally. And I started, you know, sort of writing in bullet points and figuring out how to boil things down. I had an amazing professor at Princeton named John McPhee, who's a phenomenal writer. And he always would read your, your essays. And then he would say, why do you have all these words in here? Like what are the, which words are really essential? And I always think about him reading my work and pushing me to get rid of the adjectives and adverbs that you don't need. So many words we use are redundant. And you can really streamline things and get right to the point. And I think people sometimes are afraid to get right to the point. They feel like they need to give, and especially when I was starting out, I felt like I had to give my data first before I got to the point. People will believe your data after you make your argument. So you don't have to sort of tiptoe around it and, and convince people that you have the authority to make your argument. You can make your argument and then give the backup info. So um, I try to really streamline my language and be direct and not um, tiptoe around things. So that's the piece that was hard for going from writing articles to writing 90 second scripts. And then in terms of preparing for the crosstalks, I take the same approach as I do for interviews, prepare for all scenarios. 
And also um, think about what the tough questions are you would ask yourself. So, um, you know, today I went on TV and I thought about, um, I had to prepare for a conversation um, about Meta and, and the future of this giant tech company. And so I thought, well, what are the hard questions that I would ask? Sometimes I provide those questions to the anchors so we could have, um, they could see what I'm thinking, but you never know what someone's going to say. So I try to get myself thinking about the hard questions first, and then I prepare those things as bullet points. I don't look at them when I'm talking on TV, but the mere act of writing things down helps me prepare and helps me evolve my, my thought process. I would say I do the same thing as I do um, when, I'm, when I'm preparing questions for a big live interview. The earlier I can start thinking about something, the more time I can give myself to percolate. I don't even need to work on it again later, but if I know that I'm gonna have three hours, I would rather get the work done earlier, only so my brain can keep working on it in the back of my, my mind. And I think just knowing that I'm having, you know, a good sense of what I'm gonna do, I might change my mind in the moment, but at least I've had that a little bit of extra time to think about it. Julie, and uh, thank you so much for sharing so many details. I, not that many of our listeners and viewers are in that same space, probably very, very small percentage, if any, but I think that a lot of the things that you are sharing are incredibly transferable to their careers and businesses. And uh, given that you so kindly shared with us some tips on the script, I feel that I need to ask you a little more about that because it seems like it's such a key thing that people can use tomorrow and do better with their presentations. You mentioned that you do, you kind of do your assertion, what you're talking about in the beginning and then support it with the data. Anything else in terms of the structure that people should keep in mind when they put in together their presentations? I think that um, that I, there are so many different challenges people have when they're making presentations, but I think the more people can be clear and concise, the better. If you're making a statement that is controversial, if you're making a, um, if you're presenting something to your boss that he might not, not want to hear, the instinct is to be cautious and to say, here's, I know you don't want to hear this. I know this might not make you happy. Here's why I think we have to do this thing. Maybe it's more expensive. Maybe it's more money than you want to spend. I think that makes, that's going to make your boss nervous. That's going to make our viewers nervous. I think you just have to get right to the point. And I remember when I was starting off, I used to do this thing where I would set up my story and I'd be like, here's why we're talking, here's why I'm telling you this story. Here's why um, I, I think you should be paying attention to this. And then I would get to the point and my editors would just delete the first paragraph and just say, just jump right in. What are you wasting all this time for? You, you deserve to tell the audience what they need to know. They'll believe you and they'll understand why it's important if you just get right to the point. So I think it was just interesting for a while, I would write my story out and then I would just delete the first paragraph of me, you know, tiptoeing around and trying to explain why I was even having this conversation on TV in the first place. I think that just being direct is incredibly valuable. And it also sort of relieves a lot of the anxiety. Sometimes there's anxiety in the room. Are you, is this person gonna really present this to me? Are they gonna tell me something I don't wanna hear? Just cut right to the chase because it saves everyone a lot of um, nervousness in the process, including the person you're presenting to like your boss. Julie, and as you went through this journey of uh, getting to CNBC's senior media and tech correspondent, what were some defining moments in your career? The very first one was when I went on television for the first time. Um, a lot of my colleagues have known since they were 10 years old that they wanted to be a TV reporter. And when they graduated from college, they went and worked at a local market and were doing TV from a small market because they knew their plan was to be a TV reporter. That was not my case. I just was a young reporter at Fortune magazine. I had my stacks of papers. And this there was this crucial moment where um, I'd written a story um, for Fortune magazine. And at the time, they were Fortune was owned by the same company that owned CNN. And CNN would frequently call people to come on and talk about a story they had written. And I remember I was 22 years old and I wrote this story actually about, um, I think it was 20 people who lost over a billion dollars in the stock market crash and looking at sort of where those losses were and the net worth and all these things. And, uh, 
And a bunch of people have been very angry because of the story because they didn't want to see it all laid. The people I had written about didn't want to see it all laid out in paper. That there was this phenomenal transformation of the economy happening. And um, I was just sort of laying it all out there. So CNN wanted me to come on and talk about it. And I thought, I can't do this. I'm 22 years old. I've never been on television before. Like, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to do this. And I was nervous. And I didn't feel like I had the credibility to go on. And um, my boss at the time, who I was helping report various stories, he said, of course, you should go on. You can be in a, no, you don't have to be an authority in everything, but you are an authority in this thing that you know, which is the story you reported and all the stories you reported in the last year or so, because I'd been at Fortune only for about a year at that point. And so he just encouraged me to do something that felt very risky to me. And he said, what's the worst that can happen? You're going to mess up. And I was like, yeah, that seems pretty embarrassing. He said, you should not be embarrassed. So that, that was a really key moment when I said yes. I went on live TV. I thought it was so funny that I was on live television at all, um, that I, I had sort of had a goofy smile on my face and didn't seem nervous. And I had my boss's you know, voice in the back of my head saying, what's the worst that can happen? So I think that decision to take the first leap and then, um, and then I started appearing regularly on CNN, CNN headline news, talking about business stories. And I think just pushing myself outside my comfort zone um, and saying yes. And I think saying yes when opportunities present themselves. Um, my whole life has been sort of benefiting from saying yes from opportunities. I never wanted to be a business reporter. I knew I loved journalism. Um, I applied to jobs at Entertainment Weekly and Time Magazine, but the best opportunity was at Fortune Magazine. So even though I didn't think I cared anything about business, I said yes to that opportunity. That was the best opportunity in that moment. So I think creating opportunities and saying yes when the doors open. Um, that first day on TV, I was I thought the whole thing was so ridiculous and, and nerve wracking, but somehow th the fact that I was willing to take a risk and figured what's the worst that could happen opened up many more opportunities down the line. Of course, and it is such a powerful advice saying yes. And then of course that comes also with pursuit of mastery in parallel because you need to be somewhat ready to speak on TV or whatever opportunity, amazing opportunity that may come your way. Anything that you could share in terms of advice related to pursuit of mastery in parallel of being ready to say yes. I think that's actually, th those two things are so closely tied because what my boss told me is it's okay that you're not an expert on everything. It's okay that you're 22 years old and you don't have years of experience in business news. You are an expert in this one thing. And I think that the more people can have confidence in the things that they do have expertise in and, to, and maybe just be clear, look, I'm not an expert. In, in this other thing. I mean, it's interesting on, on TV, people come on all the time and they come on because they're an expert in a certain topic. And maybe that's on an inflation. Maybe they're an expert on interest rates. And then if they're asked a question that they, they're not an expert on, it's okay to say, you know what? That is not my area of expertise. But what I do know is you know X, Y, and Z. And so I think really investing in the thing that you can be an expert in, or maybe you have a head start in being an expert in. And just what I always do is I just go crazy with the research. You know, at night I put my kids to sleep and then I just read everything that seems related to something that I might need to know. And just going deep into the research, maybe it'll be useful, maybe it won't be useful, but it'll make me smarter down the line when something tangential comes up on that topic. And then I'm an expert in that thing. Um, and then if, if someone asks me a question, which I'm not really an expert in, I'll be honest about that. And I think that transparency, sort of knowing that you can invest, and then, um, and then also that every bit of research you do, every person I, I have a background conversation with or an interview with, that might not yield something immediately, but it is going to be valuable over the long run. And I think that's just sort of this idea of you're investing in your expertise over the long run. And then if you're not an expert in everything, that's okay. And I think people really love that transparency of saying, you know what, I'm glad you asked me that question. And I don't, my expertise is really not in that, but here's something that I can answer that I think is relevant or valid or, or you know, sort of attached to that question in some way. Julia, and you mentioned putting your kids to sleep. And <sighs> one of the key challenges that my clients face, our listeners face, is this, we have so many demands on our time. We love our families, we want to be there for them, we want to spend time with them. We also want to be successful, we want to contribute. 
and you are such a great example of being able to do it all. So what would be your advice to our listeners who are trying to manage both family and very demanding career? Well, what's interesting is I, I think I have more insight into this now after I wrote a book because I wrote a book. I did not take book leave to do that. Sometimes people write a book, they'll take three months, six months, a year off of their day job to write the book. I didn't really have that opportunity, but um, I did write the book during the pandemic when my travel, which can be very intense, and I know a lot of your listeners have worked travel, my travel stopped for, for a, at least a year. And, um, and I saw an opportunity there. I saw an opportunity to take those weekends when I wasn't exhausted from traveling or the nights when I wasn't jumping on an airplane at 6 p.m. to San Francisco or New York to take those opportunities to carve out more time. So I think that um, in this new hybrid workforce, when maybe people are traveling less, um, maybe they don't have as much of a commute, I think there are opportunities to pick up hours here and then. I also have a unique situation because I work East Coast hours and I'm based on the West Coast. So I'm used to waking up really early. My TV day starts at around five with a conference call and then five Pacific, eight Eastern. And some days I'm on TV at five Pacific, eight Eastern, but I'm generally, my day starts, my TV day starts to wind down around three. So for me, that provided opportunities in two ways. One, pretty much every interview I did for the book, I did after 3 p.m. Pacific, when I was off of my day job, off of TV. Um, so I feel like I got to squeeze in an extra piece of my day um, around my East Coast hours. The other thing is I believe you can carve out time in different parts of your day. So for me, I would wake up on the weekend and I could work between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. because I was used to being up that early and it wasn't a big deal. I was just waking up the same time as I usually woke up. But there was this magic three hours on the weekend before anyone in my house was up or needed anything or expected to have me sit down with them at breakfast. And I got this, I was so productive. So I feel like if you really are passionate about a project, you can be incredibly productive and you can find these pockets of time. I did find that less than an hour was not a very a useful amount of time. But if I could have at least an hour, if I could have three hours, three hours to me was like a peak amount of time, prime time. Because if you know you have three hours, you could just sit down and work like crazy. Don't give yourself any breaks. And I think in a lot of ways, people can be more productive when they know they have these time constraints. If I had had a year off to write this book, I would have sat around and twiddled my fingers and stood up to get coffee a million times. Um, and not that I didn't do that on certain days, but I do think that I knew that I had to be efficient with my time. And I, if I had a three hour chunk on a Saturday morning or you know, on a, on a Friday afternoon when no one was around the house, I could just be the most efficient I'd ever been because I was excited and passionate about the project. And I knew I didn't have all the time in the world. Julie, and how do you balance it with still protecting your health, taking care of yourself? Well, so during the pandemic, I really realized that exercise was key for me. And if I could do even just 30 minutes a day, it was going to be a game changer. I don't want to do an ad for the Apple Watch, but I actually think that my Apple Watch has really helped me because it reminds me to stand up and walk around. It tells me how many minutes of exercise I, I was getting. And especially during the very intense period um, of those first six months of the pandemic where I was working like crazy on TV, reporting on all the volatility in the stock market. Um, and I was also trying to get my, my book you know, really started. Having the reminders in my Apple Watch telling me it was time to go to sleep. I have, a, I have a, an alarm clock on my Apple Watch. And so it would say like, if you're gonna get seven hours of sleep, you need to start getting ready for bed now. And that was just a good reminder because I have been known to putz around and, and, and you know, respond to emails way too late. So I think just the reminders of that and knowing if I could squeeze in 30 minutes of exercise um, we, you know, uh, 30 minutes on the Peloton, a quick run around in the neighborhood, then that would make me more productive also. And I think just like having the, the reminders on the Apple Watch were really helpful. Um, and also knowing that I would be a better mom, I would be better on TV, my energy would be better if I could just make sure to get enough sleep and also squeeze in enough exercise. I don't get 30 minutes of exercise every day, but I think having that as a goal has been really, really helpful. And working from home, you know, you could get up and walk up and down the block. And by the way, in California, where we both live, the weather's almost always good enough 
to, if you have a 10 minute phone call, I would take the phone call on my headphones and walk up and down the block. And so I think having um, the sort of technological tools to remind me to do that, help me, help me stay honest with that. And now that I'm traveling again, it's much harder. It's much harder because there are all these other factors like delayed flights and, uh, and, and trips to the airport and stuff like that. Of course. Julia, and to wrap up that discussion about work-life balance, because I think it's very important, any tips you have beyond working out and sleep? So maybe it's something related to diet, green smoothies, anything else that really... <laughs> um, I, 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 I try to eat healthy. Um, I think work-life balance, when I am with my kids... Um, and my husband, I try as much as possible to figure out which hours are going to be really protected and to say, okay, these are, and also not just for, for my sake, but for their sake, for both of our sakes, to know that there are certain hours that it's okay if I don't look at my phone. And another thing is I have set my watch to have reminders from certain key people. So if there is breaking news, um, I'm going to get a reminder about it on my watch. And it's okay if I'm not staring at my phone all the time. And I think we talk about staring at our phones as if it's it's just something you have to do now. But the reality is, is it's not good for stress level or for your families. So, um, you know, my husband and I made a rule about the dinner tables. If we're having dinner with our kids and you have to deal do something on your phone, you have to excuse yourself. You can't just be like, okay, and like all of a sudden go off on your phone. You have to be like, excuse me, I got a phone call. I got to deal with this. And just to not normalize being your face buried in your phone all the time. I want to model for my children that if I'm going to, you know, divert my energy away from them to my phone, I'm at least going to explain to them what's going on. I also think my kids are old enough now that it's good to tell them what I'm working on and explain why I'm excited about it. And it kind of brings them into the conversation um, rather than me just disappearing, um, uh, you know, uh, off, off of the grid for 24 hours for a work trip. I could say, hey, here's where I'm going. Here's what I'm doing. And I think my job is really cool. And I get to interview tech CEOs and media CEOs. And so I think telling them about it, um, you know, makes it all make more sense to them. Of course, making them part of it. So they're actually excited to see you working and, and they feel proud and it's good for their development. Yeah. One additional question I wanted to ask you related to that again, it makes me think of conversations I have with my clients who are very, very driven people and they want to contribute and they want to be successful. And often what happens is that they worked so hard for so long, decades, and now they're kind of nearing 40 and then they have this choice, family, no family, can I even do it? Because I have so many obligations, I cannot just step away. What advice would you give them given that you were able to actually make it happen and still. Well, well and it, I look, I'm a workaholic. I have to keep myself from working too hard. I clearly love my job. I love my TV job. I love writing this book. And I think that, um, you know, I, I just knew I wanted to have a family. And I think that if you know something you want to do, you can always make it work. And there was one female CEO who I remember um, I was talking to her and she has four children, two of them, her children, two stepchildren. I was like, God, this is before I had kids. I remember talking to her, I was like, gosh, that seems really hard. How do you possibly do it? She says, you just do it. You figure out a way and it's worth it to do all of it. And some days you might um, not get enough sleep. Some days you might not pay attention to one thing or another thing, but it's overall worth it in the long run. And, um, and I feel very grateful that I had a number of women in particular, as well as male bosses just encourage me, you just are going to figure it out. And it's not always going to be easy. But, um, but if you if it's something that you want, it's definitely worth it. And you definitely will figure it out some way or another. Thank you, Julia. So let's talk about your book, you mentioned you wrote a book. And this is, of course, a big undertaking, it takes a lot. And you are incredibly hardworking, waking up at 5am on weekends, when you have a such demanding job and you already have to wake up at 5 a.m. or earlier every day anyway. So I wanted to start this conversation from how did you pick a topic? One reason I was excited to wake up at 5 a.m. on the weekends to work on this book is because it is a topic I am so excited about. And it is a topic I'm excited to share and have people learn about, um, not just women. The book is about female leaders, but I think it's really important for everyone to learn about the data in this book um, and also to read the stories, which are just fascinating and so inspiring. And so I was inspired um, because of two things that I do in my day job at CNBC. 
One is that I created this list called the Disruptor 50 list about 10 years ago, and it's an annual ranking of the fastest growing private companies. And we are talking about all these amazing startups. This is before they go public. So we've had on the list Airbnb and Uber and SpaceX and um, you name it, any company that's really changed the way we live that's been private, um, we've had on this list. And I was so inspired by the CEOs of these companies, this idea of creating disruptive technologies. I love this is my one of my favorite projects at CNBC. So I loved working on this project and I was really impressed um, by the CEOs in general, but particularly impressed by the women. And as we know, there are not as many women um, in the tech space in particular. I mean, women comprise just about 8% of Fortune 500 CEOs. And when it comes to tech CEOs, there's even less representation. So I was really impressed by these, these female CEOs of the tech companies. And at the same time, I was working on another project. And that is a project at CBC called Closing the Gap. And that's highlighting positive stories about CEOs and companies and leaders who are closing gender and diversity gaps in business. And what I learned through that project is just how little representation women have in the tech space. So I learned that women um, in the past 10 years have, have drawn less than 3% on average of all venture capital dollars. So we know that venture capital has funded every tech company you could think of from Facebook and Google to, um, you know, to Airbnb, to the tech companies that do everything for the way we, you know, our, our lives work. Um, uh, and the, of that venture capital dollars, less than 3% has gone to female founders. So when I was thinking about these women who are so amazing, and I was thinking about this data, I thought, of course, the women are exceptional. By definition, they've had to be by definition, exceptional to defy those odds. So the book project started out as me wanting to tell these amazing women's stories. And a lot of them, people haven't heard. You know, there are a lot of female CEOs other than just the CEO of Theranos, who we've talked a lot about, but a lot of female CEOs with phenomenal success stories that are creating these, these tech businesses that are changing the world. And I thought I wanted to explain how they managed to defy the odds. What was it that they had managed to do to be in that tiny, tiny minority of a female founder of a tech, of a tech business? So I started down that path thinking like, oh, it'll just be enough for me to tell these amazing stories. But then what I realized when I started interviewing over 100 CEOs, I interviewed about 150 people for this book, is I realized that there's something actually going on here that I could, I could find data about because it's not enough just to tell stories I decided. I wanted to understand why their approaches were working. Sure, I could tell you why the CEO of a health tech company is transforming healthcare and why you should hear about how her story started in Sierra Leone and all the amazing things she's done. But actually, I should explain the strategy that she's taking. She may not even realize that she's taking it, but she's leading with empathy and contextual thinking. Here's what that means. So then I started reading hundreds of academic studies I, I was just blown away by the amount of data, not only about leadership, but about gender and leadership. And what I found is that these women's approaches that had enabled them to be the tiny minority and defy the odds, their approaches, there was a lot of data to explain why those approaches worked. So in my book, I explain these strategies that, by the way, anyone can apply. And these are strategies that oftentimes women more, more um, characteristically use or are more often used by women. But in fact, these strategies are valuable if used by anyone. So my book started off with a storytelling, but in my reporting, it ended up being sort of an intersection of stories and data to explain um, the strategies in those stories. And that's why I was so excited to get up out of bed every day <laughs> and work on it. Of course. Julie, and what were some commonalities that you discovered among all the CEOs you interviewed? Well, one thing that's interesting is when I started off reporting this book, I thought I was going to find some things that these women just had a natural advantage to, that these leaders to be so phenomenal, to create a multi-billion dollar startup with all of these headwinds against you. I'm sure these women had some natural superpowers, but I was really, really struck that no superpowers, no leadership skills are, are in, in sort of born. Everything is developed. Every single leader who you see, you might think that that you know a, a CEO emerges fully formed like Athena from the head of Zeus, but in fact, 
That is not the case. All of these CEOs and their leadership characteristics were things that they maybe had an instinct towards, like I have an instinct towards question asking, but they were characteristics that they practiced, that they studied, that they saw how they were doing. And they said, okay, I, I might be good at learning about context, but let me figure out how to institutionalize this and systematize it so I can get better at it. Um, and I think that every CEO in the book worked on self-improvement in their leadership skills. And that was inspiring to me because it made me think that we can all um, improve upon ourselves and that no one is out there born perfect as a leader or even exceptional as a leader. We all have to work on ourselves. Um, and there was one interesting thing I found um, about that is that it's not about competition. I thought, are these women going to be incredibly competitive? Are, you know, a lot, there's a lot of data about sports and athletics and leadership and how people who've done serious sports are more likely to be leaders. So I thought maybe they're like really competitive with other people. And in fact, that was not the case. These leaders are very good at competing against themselves and pushing themselves. And the most effective kind of competition is not finding someone who you can be jealous of and try to compete against them. The most effective kind of competition is against yourself and creating your own benchmarks and saying, here's where I am now, whatever my skill set is, I'm going to try to push myself further. And here's my benchmark. And being able to sort of measure and identify your own challenges against yourself, that's how these women have all improved whatever their, their uh, skill set or particular leadership approach was. I love this insight that you had. I actually demand of myself to improve at least 1% every day. Then every year you can improve at least well, over 300%. Yeah. And it's incredibly valuable. Any stories that you could share to help our listeners kind of internalize that, this advice? Oh, there are so many amazing stories. Um, I think that a lot of it, and I'll tell you a couple of stories, but a lot of it is also admitting when you are not great at something and admitting when you have a failure. And I, I just referenced the CEO of a company called City Block Health. Now this is a health tech company and they're trying to improve overall healthcare outcomes. So they are paid based on the overall health improvements of their clients and trying to minimize things like trips to the emergency room, which are incredibly expensive and oftentimes not resolving health issues. So they have you know, basically social services provided to their clients who are often lower income, figuring out if they can help people get into better housing or see their general practitioner more frequently, they might do a better job at reducing the cost and improving the health outcomes. So it's a fascinating company called City Black Health, but the woman who founded it, Toyin Ajayi, she started off her career working in Sierra Leone uh, and, and there in the capital of Sierra Leone in Freetown, she was working in a hospital. She had gone to medical school um, in London. She'd gone to Stanford. And here she was trying to improve a hospital, a pediatric hospital in Sierra Leone. This was right after finishing medical school. And she showed up in this hospital and she was horrified at the conditions of the hospital. But the main thing that she could not believe is there was no running water. And she thought, how are these doctors trying to do their jobs when it's so hard to sterilize instruments? Everything is, all these little things that people take for granted couldn't work because there was no running water. So she realized you just have to fix the, fix the water supply. You wanna to get to the core of the issue, address the heart of the issue, stop putting band-aids on things, fix the water supply, and then everything else will become easier. Fast forward a bunch of years and she's a resident in Boston. And she would have these patients come in who were very, very sick, and she would like help them with whatever the immediate problem was. And then she'd send them on their way again. And sometimes there'd be homeless people who'd come in and they'd treat that homeless person's immediate problem. But this person was homeless and sick and needed help that was much more than one doctor could offer in one afternoon of a visit. And there was one day when she was doing her rounds and she was meeting with a woman um, who was afraid to tell her something. And she was she got the woman an inhaler, she had her cough, she was on her way out, she was doing her job, she was being efficient, she was helping this woman. And as she was about to leave the room, she was like, wait a second, I'm supposed to get to the heart of the problem. I'm supposed to be fixing the water supply. She turned to the woman, she said, what is really going on here? Like, you don't just need an inhaler, is everything okay? And the woman said she basically had identified a lump in her chest, it turned out to be breast cancer, and, and, the, and Toy and Ajayi helped this woman get help. But what she realized in this process is so many of us are going about our days, trying to put a Band-Aid on the problem, trying to get from one problem to the next problem, from the one patient to another patient. 
And if you just stop for a second and say, what is the core of the problem? What is the underlying issue? In, in Sierra Leone, she had to fix the water supply before she could do anything else. And now in her company, she's trying to get, fix her, her patients' overall health in order to be able to get them healthier so they don't have to make so many trips into the emergency room. So I think this big picture perspective of, okay, you know, I, I don't want to make another mistake and rush out of another room because uh, I have the schedule to make. Let's just take a step back, see the forest through the trees and try to get to the heart of the problem. I think that that's something that she realized she hadn't been very good at. There are times when she must have missed things, but in identifying that she almost made a mistake in walking out of that woman's room who needed the breast cancer surgery, she's like, wait, I need to figure out how I can improve this myself. What is my ability to look bigger picture, to, to create systems so I don't let anything fall through the cracks. And to me, that's such an inspiration because it means we can all find ways to improve ourselves, but also find ways to take a step back and figure out in all of our works, in all of our lives, what is that water supply that needs to be fixed first? It might be a hard project. It might be a bigger project than just ticking something quick off your list, but maybe it's better to tackle the big problem and then the little problems will be easier to solve. This is such a powerful advice. Thank you, Julia. I just had a conversation yesterday with somebody and we tried to discover an issue in their Korean life and what they thought was the solution would not solve the core problem. And it's so important. You really have to go to the bottom and figure out what is that core problem is. Julia, and of course, all this very successful female entrepreneurs CEOs, they managed to get investors believe in them and their idea and back them. Did you notice any commonalities in terms of what they have done to get investors to believe in them? Well, what's the, I actually want to flip that around and say what's interesting is why investors don't believe in female founders more often, because the data shows that female founders um, are oftentimes more successful and they often re yield returns to their investors faster. So based on the data, it doesn't make sense that female founders aren't backed more frequently with higher investments, just statistically, financially, it doesn't make sense. So I was confused by that and wanted to understand why, because theoretically investors want to make money. <laughs> And so they should be prioritizing their returns. And if people were just prioritizing their returns, they'd be investing in a lot more women. What I discovered the real cause of it is, is pattern matching. And this instinct to look for someone who looks like the next Mark Zuckerberg is causing investors to overlook some of some of people who might be just as um, equipped or have just as good a business plan as someone who does not look like the next Mark Zuckerberg. There is really striking data about how powerful stereotypes are and how powerful bias is. And one thing I thought was really interesting in my interviews is a lot of the female VCs I interviewed, and there are not as many of them, they're um, vastly underrepresented in, in the VC landscape, they said to me, you know, their male counterparts, they're not trying to be biased, but it's just their instinct. A, investors make a couple of bets every year and they want to invest in someone who's like them, who they want to spend time with. So there's that instinct to invest in someone like you and also that instinct to find someone who fits a pattern. We don't have that many examples of really successful female leaders. We tend to talk a lot about the ones that have gotten taken down for one reason or another. And I mentioned Elizabeth Holmes earlier because she's a perfect example. They've been documentaries, TV shows, you name it. There is a plenty of example out there about the disaster that was Elizabeth Holmes' leadership. But we have a couple of examples of female CEOs that are often talked about. And oftentimes they're, they're white women, right? That's the sort of more, most frequent archetype of female leadership. In fact, there are a lot of different types of female leaders. I think the lack of representation of successful female leaders has hurt the ability of everyone, both male and female, to identify potential female leaders and say, hey, this person is the next Toy and Ajayi. This person um, is the next um, you know, is the is the next uh, CEO of a company like Carrot Fertility. So I think just having a lack of um, representation and a lack of archetypes is getting people stuck in the stereotypes without any malice. And that's the thing is, as I think poor investment decisions have been made without any malice. There's a fascinating statistic that female VCs are twice as likely as male VCs to invest in a female founder. 
And if something like over 80% of all venture capital funds don't have a single investing partner, at least that's what the most recent statistic, that means that those VCs are just not going to both see the deals and maybe not have the same instinct to invest in them. So if we're going to have more diverse founders get financing, we're going to need to see more diversity because bias and stereotype there's oftentimes not a lot of reason or data behind that bias and stereotype, but yet it can be incredibly powerful. And the only way to counteract that bias and stereotype is with the kind of data in my book and also with some new archetypes and new examples. So I think there's actually a huge financial opportunity for men to see the data in the book because they'll understand they don't want to miss out an opportunity to make a lot of money by investing in a female CEO or a female-led public company. And being able to identify the bias is the first step in eliminating it from your thought process. Julie, and after interviewing 150 CEOs, are there any other pieces of advice, insights that stand out for you that you would like to share with us now? Well, one, I, I think about every single day. And that's the idea that confidence can be on a dial. And I thought when I was a young business reporter at Fortune Magazine, and even in my time at CNBC, I would see these CEOs who were so full of confidence and it seemed like when they made a decision, they made it instantly, they knew what they were doing and there was no doubt. What I found, and there's a lot of data about how women don't let ego get in the way of data when they're making decisions. And so there's all this data about how women are really good at leveraging data and making decisions carefully. And on part of that, is being able to turn down your confidence when you're gathering data for decision-making. So this idea that it's good to be vulnerable, to be open to new ideas, to be unsure of your ideas when you are doing the, the, the information gathering process of decision-making. So that's when you should turn your, your confidence down on the dial. But then when you're, you're at the lowest confidence possible, you're gathering all this information, once you've gone through all the information and use that information to, to make your best decision, that's when you have to turn up your confidence and say, okay, I've done the work. I was vulnerable to my critics. I was open to new ideas. I was pulling in ideas from everywhere. There's a lot of data that female leaders are successful because they do this. Then you say, okay, I, I feel good about this decision I made. I'm not going to waver. I'm not going to tell people, oh, I'm not really sure. Here's where I think we should do. You should say, you know what? I did the work and I know this is what we should do. And once you've done the work, you can turn up the confidence dial and then just execute. And I think there's something about knowing that it's okay if I'm not confident all the time. It's okay. And in fact, it can be more valuable to use any moment where you don't have confidence, to use that as a moment to gather information and bolster your own decision-making. I think there's something really exhilarating about that knowledge. That's a great advice. Julia, and uh, so you have done a lot of research and it is packed beautifully in your book and your first book and probably more books are coming up. What are some, I hope so. <laughs> what are some critical questions that you will you want to work on next? For my for my next book, I mean, look, I think my book, um, When Women Lead, my first book, I hope to, to write more books. This book, I really wanted to delve into things that people don't realize that can be incredibly valuable and also inspirational for our day to day. Um, and something that I'm still fascinated by and even more fascinated by after talking to all of these people and reading all these studies is this idea of what enables disruptive thinking. What enables people to think outside the box and to approach problems and, and challenges differently. And if you think about the, the tech companies that have changed all of our lives, the fact that we're doing this interview on Zoom, what enables a CEO to say, or a, a, anyone, a founder to say, I have this idea and it's not something that's been done before or it's something that's been done before and it's failed. Why do they think that they should try something differently and what inspires their approach? Um, I'm very risk averse by my nature. I, I've been, had only two, two jobs in my career. And um, I think that there's something about the, the inspiration to try something totally different. And then the confidence to take a risk on something is something that's really fascinating to me. In the book, I talk a lot about how sometimes women, because they're outsiders to male dominated industries can actually use that to their advantage. And there's a great advantage to identifying when you don't have the same approach as the status quo, 
maybe you've been excluded from an industry and that's been really horrible and hard, but maybe you can figure out how to use your outsider perspective as an advantage. So I think this idea of what enables really disruptive thinking is something I'd love to, to study more and learn more about. And the other thing I'm totally obsessed with is how people use companies and businesses to solve really huge problems for the world. And I have a whole chapter in the book on purpose-driven companies and this idea that A, female founders are more likely to draw financing if they're working on a purpose-driven company, but also that purpose-driven companies have a massive advantage. One of those is that it's easier to hire talent. It's easier to, to have an extra determination when you're up against challenges as all entrepreneurs inevitably are. But I'm very optimistic that companies are going to solve massive problems, whether it's um, global warming or world hunger, and that it's businesses that are really going to be able to leverage innovation to do that. And that's something I'd love to, to work on more. I would love to read those books, especially the one about disruptive thinking. Julia, and of course, writing a book is tremendous endeavor. I wrote more than 20 books, so I know what it is like. And uh, I'm wondering, especially the book like yours, where you interviewed so many people, I wonder what are two, three ways in which this project changed how you live your life and manage your career? Um, it made me believe that no matter how hard something is, if you want it enough, and if you're excited about it enough, you will carve out the time to make it happen. So it made me think, um, and I think a lot of people feel this way during the pandemic about figuring out the things which are not essential, um, or the things that you don't need to do, uh, and, and just really thinking about prioritizing. Um, and I, I talk about it with my husband is sort of being intentional about what we're going to do. It's so easy to get sucked into one thing or another or sucked into you know, just crossing things off the list. And I think just being intentional about whether it was how I plan my weekend um, or thinking about what projects I really wanted to work on, I think that sort of planning your life with intentionality can enable you to do the things that you're really excited about. And then I just think about the lessons I learned in my book all the time, you know, whether it's dialing up or down my confidence, whether it's when I interact with someone who I think is being held back by their own bias, or if someone is telling me I'm being too bossy or being mean, I'm like, really? You know, there was a time when I might have worried about that feedback and thought that it was a reflection on me. But now I think being able to understand where to delineate between unconscious bias and pattern matching and something that's actually real has been really empowering um, and, and enabling me to be just more effective and efficient in my life. So I hope these lessons that have, have really changed the way I go about my business and do my work um, are, are as valuable for other people as well. Thank you, Julia. And I feel that our listeners would want me to ask you this question. So I have to ask it. Your advice on communication skills beyond putting together a script, we discussed it in depth, very valuable input. I would love your advice on oral communication specifically, any tips that you could share? I think um, that the key thing is don't be afraid to ask questions. I think a lot of times people are afraid to ask questions. They think it's not their job. It's my job to ask questions. So I'm allowed to ask questions. But in fact, everybody um, should ask questions. And some of the smartest, most impressive CEOs I've ever interviewed, they're asking me questions because they're curious. And I think that um, the starting point for all oral communication is, is question asking. And so maybe you're going to have to give a presentation or talk down the line, but no matter who you're talking to, people are flattered when you ask them questions and it'll only make you smarter. So that's the first thing I'd say. And the other thing I'd say is just be concise. Don't be afraid to jump to the point to say something that maybe sound controversial at the beginning, but then you could back it up with data. You don't need to walk through all your data before you make a, make a statement. It's okay to say, here's what I think, and I'm going to explain why. But first, let me tell you my thesis. And I think people really appreciate it if you get right to the point, and then they'll give you a chance to give your supporting research. Thank you, Julia. Few final questions. We are close to the end of our conversation. And this is my favorite question to ask our guests. Beyond the book and the project, what are two, three aha moments, realizations you had in the last few years that were transformative for your career and life? You know, I know um, it's been a while that we've been in this pandemic or endemic or whatever it is now, 
But there was a moment when I went from broadcasting in a studio with a great team of people to help me um, to having to do it by myself at home. And I was really scared because I had been in the industry for, at the time, it was 14 years. I had never done anything more than clip on a mic microphone, right? I had never worried about the camera or a, a teleprompter or lighting. It just wasn't my problem and I never thought about it. And there was this moment where I had to build a studio at home. I had to be in charge of my internet connection and make sure that I could be broadcasting out. And it was something that I never thought I was gonna have to do. And then when they told me I was going to have to do it, it was something I didn't think I could do. And, um, but I didn't really have a choice. So um, it really pushed me outside my comfort zone. And when I succeeded at getting my shot up and, and broadcasting from home with no help other than the help of my then seven-year-old kid, um, there was something that was so surprising about that and reassuring. It reminded me how much I love being pushed out of my comfort zone. And I think that, um, that there's there's something that's really happened in the past couple of years of the pandemic of people realizing that they're capable of more than they think. And sometimes you just have to put yourself in a situation and do it before you know that you can do it. So sometimes you'll just not realize what you're capable of until you do it. So to me that I'll never forget that day where I was assembling a tripod in my, in, in, you know, in my living room and just hoping that I could get on before the segment that I knew I had to be on TV in 45 minutes. And it was terrifying, but I, was so proud of myself that I pulled it off. It's incredible. Wow. I, I can imagine the level of uh, excitement, but also stress of having yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, well done on getting it done. And especially in a situation where generally, if it was normal conditions, someone will come from CNBC and set yes. it up for you, but yeah. you have to do it and order everything from somewhere and figure out how to connect all the wires. Yes, yes. With a, and by the way, with a lot of help, and I've been very grateful, but you realize that there are things that, you know, you can, you can be part of the process. And since then, you know, I've had my amazing colleagues at CNBC set up various other home studios for me, but, um, and I'm so grateful when I, when I'm back working with them in person, but um, I just think this idea that sometimes you just have to do it and know that you'll figure it out. Of course. Julie, and what are a few books that you found instrumental for your growth as a professional, but also as a human? Oh, so many books. Um, the one that I think about a lot, um, both as a, as a professional, but also in terms of, um, of child rearing is Grit. And that is a phenomenal book. And it just reminds me of how it's great to work hard. This is Angela Duckworth. It's so important to work hard and to push yourself. And I think that that's a huge opportunity for every, if you haven't read the book Grit, you have to read it. It's phenomenal. Um, there's also um, a couple of books written by Eve Rodsky. She wrote a book called Fair Play about balancing work in a, in a family at home. And it's so fascinating. And it's also very data driven. And um, she wrote another book that recently came out called, it came out this year called Unicorn Space um, about this idea that we all benefit if we have a creative endeavor and that it's not good to work nonstop all the time and that you actually will benefit professionally if you give yourself a true hobby that you can pursue. And, th and that has really reminded me of the advantages of, of giving my brain a break um, and doing something that is just purely creative and enjoyable for me. So I, I, I love both of those two books from her. Oh, yes, it's so incredibly important. And then you get insights and solutions that you haven't thought of. And it's usually so simple. Wow, how did I not thought of that? Julie, and um, what would be one thing that you would want our listeners to do tomorrow morning at 8 a.m.? Let's assume it is a business day differently because of this conversation today. Well, I hope that they will all go out and buy my book, When Women Lead. So I hope that is the first thing you'll do. There's the audiobook version, there's a Kindle version, there's a paper book version. So buy that book. But I also think that we would all benefit from trying to figure out when we're doing things just because that's the way we've always done them. And that's because everyone else has always done them that way. And I think this idea of pattern matching and bias we get so stuck in these patterns and whether it's a pattern about who we should be investing in or the way to, to, to hire someone, we just do them because that's the way it's always been done. And that shouldn't be the case. We will all benefit if we take a step back, 
look at some new archetypes, look at some new examples, like the ones I highlight in my book and figure out from, from our world, what have we been doing because we're just stuck on this hamster wheel and how can we benefit from looking at new examples and trying to create new archetypes and, and new ways of doing things. And I think that in all of our lives, there's just, it's so easy to get stuck into a routine. Um, but the first step is identifying that routine and identifying our own patterns and biases. And there's so much opportunity to break free from that. So true. This is a great place to end this session. Before we do that, Julia, do you have anything else that you would like to add or share? No, I mean, I think that, you know, your listeners know it's so hard in this, this business world. The business world seems to be changing every single day. There's so much volatility, so much unpredictability. We don't know what the, the business world, the stock market, the workplace is gonna look like in a year or two years. And I think the main thing we can focus on is improving our own efficiency and our own ability to, and I hate to use the cliche, but to think outside the box, but to really break through free of the patterns, identify our own, instincts that are good and are, are the things that we think are our own superpowers and then improve upon them. And I'm just, I think everyone has an ability to create their own benchmarks and, and push themselves in a way that's really gratifying. Thank you very much, Julia, for being with us today. We really appreciate the time. Such a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me. Our guest today again has been Julia Borstein. You can check out Julia's book. It's called When Women Lead, What They Achieve, Why They Succeed, and How We Can Learn From Them. And I'll see you all next time.